Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. I'd like to make a note before we get started that if you would like to read the subtitles of what is being said, please click the CC button on the bottom of the screen. I'm Adrienne Tungate, Executive Director of Global Strategy at World Business Chicago. Chicago has 29 sister cities around the world, and we have over 600 volunteers here in Chicago working to promote citizen diplomacy through education, culture, business, and professional exchanges. And we are here this morning as part of our Global Youth Ambassadors Leadership Summit, which is our flagship education program. We partner with the University of Illinois at Chicago to host the summit, which this year has brought over 50 young women from across Chicago and around the world together virtually this week. This is our biggest cohort, and we are able to do that this year because although we are sad that it's not in person, and we are able to bring more students together virtually this week. And they're here to learn about leadership, activism, and how they can create change for issues that are important to them and in their communities. It's been a really busy week for them discussing issues such as climate change, mental health, women in STEM, women in sports, and gender-based violence. And they are learning that leadership can take many forms. I'm really proud that this is our sixth year hosting the summit and it happens with the support of many people. So I'd like to thank our planning committee, our committee members, and our 50 volunteers who read our applications. And I'd most especially like to thank our sponsors, the Dr. Scholl Foundation and PNC, who are longtime supporters of the summit and joining us here today. Thank you. And thank you to our panelists. I'm so excited that you've all come together to talk about women and leadership. After the panel, we'll introduce four of our youth ambassadors who will join the questions and answers session. And they're representing their class of 50 ambassadors who are joining us from the audience today. Audience, feel free to ask questions in the Q&A and also upvote questions that you'd like to hear answered. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Dr. Natalie Bennett, who's the Director of Women's Leadership in the Resource Center at UIC. Dr. Bennett is a scholar activist whose research, teaching, and activism centers on the lives of Black women and girls. Dr. Bennett has been involved in the summit since the beginning, and I'm so incredibly fortunate and privileged that I've had the opportunity to learn alongside our ambassadors from her for the last six years. Dr. Bennett. Hello, uh, greetings to everyone who's here and those who will be watching after this uh, event has ended. Uh, events like this don't actually ever end. They continue, I think, the conversations that are generated uh, continue um, well past this moment. Thank you again to um, my team and for the opportunity to moderate this conversation today. A core aspect, and I believe a point of celebration of the Global Youth Ambassadors Leadership Summit program is the way that it holds space for intergenerational conversations between adult leaders and makers of current movements, corporations and communities, and a diverse group of 14 to 16 year old participants who are as curious about the how and why of current approaches to leadership as they are, rightly so, skeptical of whether grown folks really are paying attention to the right things or leading in the right directions. So whether the conversations concern challenging the dominant media representations of women and girls, or lifting up strategies and actions used by girls affected by climate change and environmental disasters, or even listening to how girls of color analyze and respond to gender-based violence, the exchanges that typically happen here have explicitly linked leadership, the work of defining issues and setting agendas with justice, the kinds of action and policy and thinking about how to right wrongs and how to create more equitable organizations, cities and societies for all of us. This is necessary feminist work, I believe, and I'm grateful for the partnership with Chicago Sister Cities in creating this platform. And I really do believe we need more of these. So equally important to listening to these women today who are quite formidable in their own right, they're gonna talk about the things that they have done, 
part of what we also want to learn, I think about is about how they come to be doing these things. And so if there's a theme that emerged during or pre-conversation with today's panelists, it's a reminder that the process about the process of leadership and leadership is about becoming. And so here I'm reminded of the image of the Sankofa bird that is part of the Akan language system and African diasporic visual culture. And you may have seen this image. It's a bird that is, its feet are pointed forward, but it is perpetually looking behind to retrieve an egg that is carrying on its back, guarding with its own life, and which will create a future beyond that bird. The meaning can be actually quite simple. Look backward, pay attention to what you're carrying, pick it up and use it to move forward. So here I invoke the image of Sankofa to think about how we individually as well as collectively carry history with us, how we're always guided by how we use our past as well as our decision not to look back at all. And so one of the big conversations, I think points of conversation that I think I hope to emerge from this uh, event is what do our guests bring from our past into their current practices of leadership? And so now let me introduce them briefly so that we can start the conversation. Uh, first, uh, we have with us Joanna Hornsnail, who is a partner at the global law firm of Mayor Brown and whose legal practice is at the intersection of public finance and infrastructure development. Uh, Joanna is an active member of her firm and the city of Chicago and has been recognized many times for her distinguished service. She currently serves as chair of Mayor Brown's diversity steering board and as chair of the board of directors of Cabrini Green Legal Aid. And of course, you can read the fuller bios in the program um, uh, for yourselves. Next, we have Shermin Cruz, who is attorney, consultant, adjunct faculty at Northwestern University's Pritzker School of Law and producer of TED Talks. Professor Cruz is the founder and CEO of My Reality Cubed and provides organizational management consulting, leadership diversity and inclusion training, tactical empathy training, which I wanna learn about, executive coaching services, and is a critically acclaimed writer of the novel uh, Butterfly Stitching, as well as actually much more public writing that uh, she has done. And I hope that we learn some more about that. Uh, Pumzile Mazibuko, who is Consul General of the Consulate of uh, South Africa. And Ms. Mazibuko is, uh, her responsibilities involve promoting trade and investment and en enhancing relationships between South Africa and the United States, based here in the Midwest region, uh, which is comprised of 14 states. Ms. Mazibuko has served in various capacities in national and provincial government in South Africa including serving at the South African High Commission at New Delhi, India, and being a desk officer at the Greater China Desk. Last but not least is Megan Webster, who is a principal at Gensler Design Firm in Chicago, and who helps shape the firm's strategic vision and strategy, leverage research and build client engagement. Trained as an architect, Ms. Webster is a frequent blogger and speaker and works on a broad range of projects related to education. Uh, Megan is an active member of the Urban Land Institute, currently serves on the UI, UDIC National Product Co Council, and was recognized as one of Building Design and Construction's 40 Under 40, class of 2018. So that's a little bit about our panelists. Now I'm going to pose a kind of series of questions that, I, that they will respond to but also that I hope that they will respond to each other's uh, responses and so that we can have a generative uh, conversation that our ambassadors can really participate in and learn from. So my first question, right, to begin at the beginning, often when young people are put in a room in front of adults to listen, it often feels like a one-way conversation of adults talking to young people. And so I suspect that they're listening, not just for what kind of brilliant things you're doing right now, but they're also listening to see who you were when you were at their age and how you connect with people who are their age in their work. So I thought, let's talk a little bit about your leadership journey. 
So the question, take us back to when you were 14 to 16 years old. Where were you? What steps did you take? What pitfalls did you experience that brought you on the path that you're now on? Who were your mentors or allies? Any lessons that you want us to, that you took with us uh, to this past moment? So whoever wants to start. I'd be happy to start. It's, it's always uh, the first time you want to make sure you're respectful of your fellow panelists because I'm sure they have wonderful things to say, but I'm going to go ahead and jump in and get us going. So first, I uh, thank you for that great introduction, Dr. Bennett. I did want to, because Dr. Bennett alluded specifically to tactical empathy and it relates so very much to this question, Dr. Bennett. So one of the things I just want to say is, is it's important to focus and take a second to focus on the power of listening because so much of listening is, of course, as we think about learning and digesting, but so much of listening is informing us on what we should be saying in order to tactically address ourselves with the room. So for instance, one of the things we teach in tactical empathy is if you picture, picture yourself in a negotiation room, and let's say you come into the negotiation room and you know what everyone in the room is thinking, you know exactly what they want, you know exactly what they'd be willing to give up and what they wouldn't, you know exactly what matters to them at the end of the day, what their pride points are, what their push points are. That's power, right? That's weaponry. You could use that in your negotiation. And that's what empathy is. And in a lot of ways, you can, through listening, gather the information necessary in order to get what you want out of that room. So first I want you to stop thinking of listening as something that has to be passive. It is something that can very much be active and be a component of your participation. As for my own path, it was very different because I immigrated from Iran to the West when I was 11 years old. And in, when I was around 14, which is the, the specific age range that, that Dr., Dr. Bennett posed, I remember her that I just decided, it's the weirdest thing, but I suddenly decided that I was going to be a straight A student in school. And the reason I made that decision is that I, I knew that my education would be for me, I didn't come from a family that had power or fortune or connections. And I knew for me that my education was what I had. And the reason my parents had given everything up to come to the West was what I had in order to succeed. And so as soon as I tweaked that, and I will say as far as mistakes prior to that, I was not at all concerned in prior to that about what my grades were. It seemed silly to me, given everything else I'd experienced as a child growing up in post-revolutionary Iran during a time of war. There was six rocket attacks a day into my city when I, when I left Iran. So it just seemed rather silly, and American schools seemed rather silly. I mean, I'm just being candid. But at one point, I just decided no, this is my future. And that's when I, that's when I really put my, my feet down and the world started to respond differently to me. Um, I obviously have a lot more to say, but I don't want to take up more room than that because I, I'm really curious to hear from my fellow panelists. Yeah, anybody else want to jump in? Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Bennett. It's an honor to be part of this um, esteemed inspirational group of women leaders uh, talking to young women who are also inspiration in their own areas. Um, I'm Pumzile. At 14 years old, I was in high school in apartheid South Africa. And at that time, I, um, we just knew that we were living under oppression. We were living um, in a period where the freedom struggle and aspiring for something better than what you have was the theme of the day. And um, President, uh, our former president Nelson Mandela had just been released from prison. So it was a period of hope. It was a period of um, anticipation, but it was also a period of great strife. There was a lot of violence, uh, political violence, um, it was a period of transition. Um, our negotiated settlement had not been born. It was under negotiation and it was a period of prayer. So I remember um, literally knowing that I want to be something. And I started um, reading um, you know, books on careers, uh, different careers. My parents um, had, uh, were teachers 
in Soweto. Soweto is a township just outside Johannesburg. And my parents um, sent me to school in town. So I used to travel in a minibus taxi to go uh, from Soweto into town to get into school. And um, and I, I remember feeling like I was a representative, you know, of black people in a white school. <laughs> and I used to tell uh, uh, my friends or anybody who cared to listen that I'm going to be the ambassador and I'm going to represent South Africa in Switzerland. And at that time, black people were not allowed in the Department of uh, Foreign Affairs, but it was just something, a hunger within me. Um, I participated in sports, I participated in debating clubs. I made sure that I was part of something, part of telling my story. Um, and because at that time, uh, white people um, would say that they were not aware of the repression or what was happening to black people in townships. So it was almost like me providing a window of actually, um, I, I and, and by the time I got to high school, my friends and I had decided um, because we were not allowed to speak uh, probably Zulu during class, we had to speak in English. So we decided we we're gonna start telling these white girls or our friends, our pe people our age, our experiences of where we come from, from the township, was, was, which was very different from their own. So I'm so happy to be part of this, um, of this group. And think that um, change is part of leadership. And I think that um, how you respond to change, how you prepare yourself um, uh, for future change um, is always something that you do when things are not going well, when you don't know what the future holds. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Okay. Yeah, thank you for that comment. Anybody else wanna jump in? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I, I was fortunate to not have the kind of upheaval that our, our other panelists are describing that they went through at such a young age. But I do think if I think back to my teenage years, I got, I don't know how I became interested, but I became interested in sort of governance and who makes decisions and, and how do you get behind the scenes and be part of a decision making process and I just started volunteering for leadership opportunities where I saw them like an ability to serve on a committee at school. And I just liked how that felt to know what was happening to think about what was needed to try to implement changes that might be helpful to my peers generally. And then by the time I got to university, um, that it was something that I really liked and enjoyed. And I just kept asking for opportunities to be involved in governance and leadership. And I was in a sorority in university, which um, for, for those who are not aware of what a sorority is, it's, it's like a social club for women, um, but it has a governance structure and it has officers and it has a lot of different positions. And in my sorority, there are about 200 women. And we had a house that about 60 people lived in and it was, um, actually a fairly serious leadership opportunity to, I was eventually elected president of the sorority. Um, and I think I was probably elected president because I volunteered to do it. I, you know, I was generally well liked by my peers, but once I got into the position, um, I realized we had some really serious work to do this at this time there. And still to this day, of course, lots of issues with um, drinking, underage drinking, um, accidents, date rape, things that flow from um, young people drinking too much alcohol and sometimes drugs. And I had to undertake some really challenging issues and um, implement some changes and some new rules within the sorority and within that system at my university that were not popular whatsoever. But I realized that for us to make a change and stop the violence and the accidents that were sometimes stemming from this overconsumption, we had to make some changes that wouldn't be popular. And I think that was that's the first leadership experience I remember being very difficult and really having to think tactically about um, tactical empathy, I think is what I did have to think about is how do I hear the objections that are coming from different people? How do I take those into account? How do I reassure people that what we're working on is for the better good, even if it's inconvenient, even if it's not what we want to do, you know, with our time this weekend. Um, and I learned, I learned a tremendous amount from that that has served me in, in my professional career later. I'll just go ahead and add on to that. Can everyone hear me? Okay, I've had some audio issues. Um, so, and I'm so, I was a sorority president as well <laughs> and had some very similar <laughs> experiences. But I, you know, I actually remember, I think the hardest part about it was 
you know, you were sort of always navigating and negotiating the fact that these were your friends um, and, and you had to um, move into that leadership role in sometimes a very, you know, kind of selfless way um, and make decisions that were the unpopular decision. Um, but I, you know, I, I remember when I was um, elected into that, I, I was really surprised. You know, I, I always have thought of myself as an unlikely leader. Uh, you know, I was I was focused on architecture. I was focused on becoming a designer. Frankly, I was an introvert. Um, I would say if you had told me when I was 14 that I would spend 99% of my day talking with people <laughs> and presenting in front of people um, when I was, you know, now in my career, I, I don't think I would have believed it. It was it felt very unnatural to me. Um, but I, I think what I realized, both as a designer, um, but also just in, in the different leadership opportunities that I had, that um, a lot of those skill sets, you know, a, a leader is not always someone who is the loudest voice in the room. Um, and, uh, you know, Shermeen, I love what you said about listening, um, that, you know, I, I always was a good listener. And um, what that helped me build up um, was, was an understanding, an empathetic understanding uh, and and you know, that's something that we do in design a lot, right? So, um, and we not only listen, but we also we also really ask the question of what if, um, what could be. Um, and I think the the real sort of power of design is when you're able to ask those questions of what if, but you also are able to accept the fact when your hypothesis was wrong. <laughs> um, and I think that very much ties to to leadership. You know, having that vulnerability to to admit that. Um, you know, you, your first pass was, was not exactly what, what was the case, and, and that's okay. Well, if I may, Dr. Bennett, uh, there's a couple yeah, of things yeah. I wanted to dovetail on. First of mm -hmm. all, I just thank you so much. I've learned so much already during this presentation from these amazing women. Pumzile mentioned something about change being a part of leadership, and it, mm -hmm. it really made me think very... Um, very recently, so I teach, one of the things I teach at Northwestern Law School is leadership. And it's a, a, one of the speakers, one of my TED speakers, who's actually uh, speaking on Monday, is the new dean of Northwestern Law School. And she's talking about uh, inclusive, inclusive crisis leadership. And it's really mm -hmm. interesting because so much of leadership is what you do in a crisis, right? So mm -hmm. much of leadership is what you do when you don't know what to do. <laughs> And when you have to make fast decisions and you have to do it authoritatively, but you still have to do it democratically. And it's a very, very challenging thing to think about. And I, I just wanted to, because Pumzula mentioned that, that whole, the, the change, it comes at you all the time, right? Except you're the one, not just determining your own course, but the course of whatever community, entity, program, sisterhood, brotherhood that you might be, that you might be leading. I, I think it's it's so interesting what uh, Megan said about leaders aren't always the loudest voice in the room. You, you need to listen, but then remember also what she said right after that. She said, you also need to ask the right questions. Mm -hmm. So it's re when we talk about listening, we're not talking about passive, passivity, right? We're not talking about silence. And I think it's really important to, to make that note. It's no, I would never think that anybody in this room, certainly not, not me, but anybody in this room would tell you to be silent. What we're, what we're encouraging is the listening leads to the questions, which then lead to the right answers, right? And then that's when you get to speak and present. And that's when, when your voice carries, even though it's, it's not the loudest voice in the room. And that's when, like Joanna said, you ask for those leadership opportunities and you get them because you've already demonstrated that that's the kind of leader that you're gonna be and that's what people want. That's a really important intervention I think you're making um, because one of the things that, and even in conversations with the ambassadors at different points, when people are talking about leadership, they name like authority and control and the one who sets the agenda and the one who basically tells everybody else what to do, the one who is the voice of whatever the issue or concern is. And you're, you're kind of asking us to, to rethink that idea of leadership that has been received and that many people are still working on. And so I wanna kind of hear from all of you, like what are some 
what, what are the kinds of qualities of, of leadership that you've been told constitutes a leader, right? That's been offered as almost like models for you. Um, and how have, has, how have you sought to challenge or kind of recreate some different ideas around leadership through that, through that model that you've been told or that you've been given? Thank you. Um, I'll, for me, growing up, uh, you know, in a system with uh, amazing, inspirational, transformational leaders. I mean, we grew up uh, with uh, President Nelson Mandela in jail. So he was an idea that um, we always aspired because we always believed he would come out, although we didn't know he would. It was just a belief. But when he did came, come out and he was this amazing and inspirational and transformational leader. He was not angry. He had, he came, he seemed to have all the solutions, you know, so we, we, we really then, I was taught that a leader is a, mor a moral leadership is important. He has all the answers and he leads from the front and he is this person that has this big inspiration and moral authority, which I then, didn't consider myself a leader when I was actually in leading positions because I was still expecting myself to aspire to to have the credentials of a struggle leader who you know is like um, inspirational. Um, and I've only just recently, you know, because you never stop learning. I'm I'm currently uh, busy with the Masters in Communication Science program um, at Northwestern University, and it it got it has a component on leadership which we were doing, and it and that component I've learned that leaders leaders actually listen more, like um, uh, Professor Cruz was saying. They beyond just listening they ask questions all the time and they reflect on those questions. So not only do they ask the questions, but they reflect on what it is that is going on around them. How do they provide, what is it that they do better? You know, whereas I was more used to a leader that's always instructing, talking, providing the answers. Whereas I'm learning more to be quiet, to listen, and it's not easy and to ask questions. Because when you get into a room, they say, oh, here's the Consul General. She'll tell us what to do. Really? <laughs> Actually, I'd rather listen to you. And that's what I'm learning. I would love to also hear from Joanna because Joanna, aren't you in construction law? Isn't that a very male dominated industry? Yes, Megan, I'm sure can attest to this as well. Megan too, uh, yeah. With <laughs> I mean, I bet also with consul generals, candidly. <laughs> yes, I mean, oh, literally, literally where is where do we not have to? Right, what industry isn't male dominated? Yeah. It's true. Yeah. yeah, sadly, I do think as I was listening to this, I agree entirely that such an important component of leadership is listening and not trying to be the loudest voice in the room all the time. But you know, when you've got something to say, say it and make your point. Mm -hmm. You know, very confidently. Um, and I think that's how so I've sort of approached the career. I, I, for, for years and years, it was very often the only woman in the room in a negotiation with, you know, maybe 20 men. And in some ways, you know, I thought, well, it kind of serves you well to be the different person, um, as long as you're not just pushed to the side. And I think... Um, listening to the conversation about women as, as as sort of more empathetic leaders i think that that is you know i don't i don't want to stereotype men versus women but i do think it's a skill set that comes more naturally to women to listen and empathize and synthesize information before just talking and going forward and and so um for those who don't know what a, like a construction lawyer does I don't, I don't argue in court. That was not my, my career path. I don't like that kind of litigation approach, but I negotiate contracts and I negotiate big contracts to build like infrastructure in the city to build a new toll road, for example. And the contracts are about 300 or 400 pages long sometimes. And sometimes you have 20 or 30 people that you talk to in order to get to the end of the end of the contract and negotiate a contract. And so you, if you, when I, and I'm representing a client, so I want to achieve the objectives of my client in negotiating that contract. It's a lot of listening, but also it's a lot of needing to lead. And um, just everything that we've said here is what I employ and work every day is listening, asking questions, exactly 
the, you know, the tactical empathy, what, what are you trying to get out of this? What do you need in order to agree to what I'm suggesting? And here's a proposal. Um, and it's, you know, it, it works. And I do think women are somewhat more suited at times to this type of approach that I think is modern leadership. Yeah, I, you know, I, I was actually, um, uh, you know, so I mean, you talked about obviously you're at Northwestern. One of the one of the things that I did, I think my when I was on maternity leave with my second child, um, needed a little bit more intellectual stimulation. <laughs> but I also, <laughs> I also um, was at a watching point where Bucky the Vampire was, Slayer reruns wasn't enough for yeah, you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I was also at a point where I found myself though um, in the position of leading a lot more people and teams and. Uh, you know, frankly, I felt very ill-equipped to be doing that. And I thought, you know, there must be, I, I, I didn't go to business school. I went to architecture school. You know, there must be some secret that I'm missing that if I just learned it, I would, I would be much better off. And so uh, fortunately at the time, Northwestern was offering an organizational leadership course um, that I could take entirely online. And uh, I, I figured going into it, you know, this was going to be way above my head. I'm not going to I mean, this is going to be a big stretch learning curve for me. And instead, what I found was that a lot of what leadership is was very present in what I was already experiencing. And I actually did have the tools, but it was a matter of really building up an awareness and, and seeing, you know, recognizing those experiences and then having some tangible strategies that, that I could equip myself with. And I, you know, I will never forget what an impact that that course had on me. Um, and, and it, you know, I think above all, it gave me confidence, right? It gave me confidence that I actually could do this. Um, and, you know, so I think it, it's, it's something that, you know, those qualities of a leader are, are things that you have in yourself, but I think it is important to name it, to recognize it, and then to be able to leverage and harness it um, as you move forward in your own experiences. What do you ladies think about the role of body language in leadership? It's something I've started to teach recently. I think it's important to be aware. You know, we're often not aware of our body language, but I think mm -hmm. it is a good thing to think about. Mm -hmm. And I for think, the, I mean, I sorry, think go ahead, Megan. Oh, go ahead. Well, I was, I think it's extremely important. Um, I, you know, I am, I'm, Still young, which is great, but oftentimes I think it is hard to gain credibility. I'm a I'm a petite person. I guess you can't tell that on the screen, but um, I think always, you know, it, it is something that I grew very aware of in terms of my physical presence um, and and recognizing that you know showing up is just as much about um, how you are there physically as opposed to just your intellectual contributions. Um, so I I think it's extremely important. Uh, yeah, I was gonna, that's really good. I mean, this is, that alone is like another hour's conversation, I think. Um, but the, the, the ways that um, I think women's bodies, physical bodies gets interpreted uh, inside of spaces, you know, with the meetings or site visits, et cetera, um, has a huge impact on how your leadership is understood and um, and and treated, and even whether it's regarded and recognized as leadership, and so yeah, there's there's strategies that many women use. Um, you know, the power suits, the kind of um, the ways that you do, that you organize your hair, the ways you organize your speech, etc. Um, all of that is a way to to get the kind of to move the, 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 the barriers, at least one barrier out of the way so that you can actually say what you have to say. But sometimes it's a, it's a thing that you, you can control only so much, right? And so that's also like an interesting part of leadership is, is how do you deal with the kind of the negative responses to the ways that you carry yourself, even though you know that what you're doing is perfectly appropriate for the space and the setting, yeah. Yeah. So true. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree with um, all that's been said. I think, um, unfortunately, uh, for us as women, um, 
everything that we do, there's almost a um, uh, like a microscope that we, we're being measured, we're being told, uh, for instance, as a diplomat, this is how you need to present yourself and mm -hmm. no, no bold red colors and no this, no this. So, and it's up to us to, you know, to find our space and to know what it is that you represent, you know, where mm -hmm. do you come from? I've um, learned um, over the years that um, I love my Zulu beads. Mm -hmm. And even if I'm wearing a power suit, I'll make sure that my earrings present something. But in my career, they've, um, they've helped me because they also um, help me to strike up a conversation, you know, mm -hmm. with somebody and I end up talking about South Africa, which is what uh, it is that I, I, I do. But I think it's important important that um, um, you know who you are and you represent that as best as you can you know with all this con you know we get told mm -hmm. your hair needs to be like this you, you need to be like that to represent something and I believe that you still need to know who you are and try to represent that as best as you can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that opens up I think a uh, question um, you know about what is it that you think uh, young women should be told, really need to be told based on your own kind of life experience um, about how to become and what it means to become a leader in contexts, in societies that treat, um, that are marked by all kinds of inequality. So, thinking of course for the ambassadors who are coming from many societies, all of which have their own internal kind of divisions and hierarchies. What does it mean? What do you think young women need to know um, as they're preparing and becoming leaders in those kinds of societies where they're constantly having to negotiate inequalities in some fashion? Um, I know that um, in the room, uh, we have a, an ambassador from South Africa, Nikita from Durban. Hi, Nikita. I know you've had quite a, a busy and very difficult week. Uh, we've had a, a, a challenges in South Africa during this week uh, with uh, mm -hmm. protests and, and, and riots. And I know that was centered mainly in KwaZulu Natal where Nikita is. Mm -hmm. And I think I can talk directly to you and say, never lose hope. Mm -hmm. um the, the 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 passion that is within you um you know you've got some god given dreams that are within you um always be hopeful that things will get better that the sun will shine tomorrow even when things are difficult but i think um just to get to the question that um what is it that we say to young girls don't lose your voice cuz whatever is in you comes out. So I, um, when I was in, 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 in high school, I went to an all girls school and we were taught to believe that as a young woman, there's nothing impossible that you can do. You can ride the fastest motorbike, you can climb the highest mountain, you can even change your own light bulb and change your own tire. And basically you don't need a man for anything. <laughs> But when I got to, to varsity and the world of work, I realized that mm, actually, you know, it seems like men run this joint, you know, so you need to, uh, and, and I, unfortunately for me, I, I almost uh, dialed my voice. I, 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 I kept quiet in areas where I should have spoken out, but you shouldn't lose that. You know, as a young woman, what you have to say matters and you have solutions and, and your solutions don't have to be the way things have been done before by mm -hmm. other people. Mm -hmm. Very important point, yes. I, I would just add um, that this is all very important, um, that my advice would be, don't be intimidated if you look around you and you don't have role models who look just like you. And you know, if you look to the leaders and the types of positions you aspire to be in, you might not see people who look just like you. And I think we probably, all of the panelists have experienced that in our careers. And so it is important to recognize you can still have mentors and sponsors and role models who don't look like you and you don't have to aspire to be 
just like any one person who you can see ahead of you, but you can take um, bits and pieces of what you see around you and make your own leadership style. Um, and so just don't get, don't give up if there's not someone who's done exactly what you are going to do, um, who looks just like you, it doesn't mean you can't do it. Yeah, I think, you know, that I was absolutely, Joanna, I mean, I think that's something that, you know, I found as well that you you, you see kind of bits and pieces of, of what you might want to be and what your path might be. Um, I, I think also it's never, it's never too early to lead, right? I mean, I, I think without even seeing most of you live on this screen, I would imagine many of you have al already become leaders, right? That you, and, and, and that is so very much tied to looking outward, to looking at the people around you, um, because you can't lead if you don't have followers. <laughs> um, and so, but, but in order for that to really, you know, happen, um, a lot of what, a lot of what that comes from is being able to resonate with your audience. Um, and, and so that, that is very much about, again, that empathy, that ability to walk in someone else's shoes. Um, and I, I would imagine many of you are already um, starting to lead or have been leading for, for a number of years. And I think um, the other thing is just is the dogged optimism, right? The, you know, Pumbilia uh, said, don't, don't lose hope. Um, but I think that, you know, sort of relentless belief that no matter what happens, you can pull yourself out of it, right? You have the ability um, to work together across um, a number of different people to pull yourselves out together that, that it will, you know, it will be okay. And I think that that is, that is something that you always need to exude and evoke and, and inspire people around you because that is for the, for people is it's like, they want to follow that, right. They want to follow that hope. Um, have one more minute before q and a i yes very so, little go so ahead we have, yeah so last question really it's actually the perfect way to bring all this together so given these the kind of experiences that have punctuated your own leadership journey um what are the ways in which you celebrate your wins, the ways that you recognize your own losses or um, setbacks? What are the rituals that you have in your own life um, that characterize your leadership journey? Yeah, so I'm gonna say something a little conventional. I actually coach meditation in my spare time, just not as a profit-driven thing, but for as a fun thing. Mm -hmm. But what, another thing I really love to do is, is street fighting. So mm -hmm. I literally go to a gym and I, punch a bag and sometimes you just need to hit people sometimes you just you know, need to do that sometimes you just need to do that you know and and you know what it sounds ridiculous but women sometimes need to learn to scream mm -hmm. and it's interesting because it's something we are taught in self-defense and when I say street street fighting I mean it's it's real combat training because I'm not I'm not in a ring trying to make it to the Olympics it's more if I get jumped in an alley in 30 seconds or less how do I get out with the adrenaline flowing through my body and the fear going through my nerves, being disoriented. Again, think back to what we talked about, what leadership is and how often things are thrown at you. How do I compose myself, figure out one or two maneuvers in those 30 seconds that I can do to make myself safe and leave? And it's it's and, and then you know manage the situation. So I would say try to think, and you know, a lot of that comes through meditation, but a lot of it comes through figuring out a lot of people do it through sports, right? Take a baseball bat and hit the ball as it's coming at you or, you know, what, whatever, whatever athletic activity, I was never into sports. So for me, this, this works really well. I, I think you need to find ways where your physical body, not just your mental state can get accustomed to that feeling of disorientation and acting in that state of disorientation. That's something that I really enjoy that works really well for me. It also just feels really good to punch a bag for an hour, so. Other folks, what are you, what are the rituals? What are the ways in which you oh, kind of I love the manage? Professor Cruz. Um, I'll <laughs> try the punching a bag. <laughs> it sounds amazing. <laughs> or squeezing <laughs> something, yes. Squeezing something. Uh, but for me, um, I'm a Christian. Uh, I, on a daily basis, I wake up an hour before 
it gets busy just to have my quiet time, read my Bible and just reflect um, on life. And I've done this for years. Every Monday is just a day of um, fasting and prayer for me. Yeah, I mean, having a strong spiritual life, uh, whether that's, a that's based in religion or whether that's based in practices of meditation, those are all kind of rituals that I think I keep hearing them among other um, women leaders, especially about what it takes to, to build a life that, that allows you to continue to do the work that you really love. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, just, I think mine is very conventional too. I mean, I, I'm a runner, um, not, I mean, I, there's nothing to write home about, but you know, I, I just have a, a very regular cadence of running. And I think for me that it helps me clear my head if I'm, if I'm kind of perseverating on something, um, it always helps me to sort of think more clearly about it. Um, I think that that physical activity just helps your brain work differently. Um, there's something, I mean, it, whether it's endorphins or something else, there is, there is a shift in how you think about, or how, at least how I think about problems um, that I'm trying to tackle. Um, and I actually, probably like six or seven years ago, um, every Monday, um, Mondays, there's something about Mondays, <laughs> um, I started just writing very quickly, you know, what are the, what are the three things that I'm grateful for? And they very rarely have anything to do with work, <laughs> um, but rather, you know, all of the other things, right? And I, I think that helped me bring perspective and just recognize that, you know, again, no matter how um, stressful something seems in the moment, I mean, life is much bigger <laughs> um, and, you know, you can get through it. Yeah, it, it feels like everyone is touching on um, separating yourself from work sometimes and doing something different than what we're all doing in our in our day jobs. And I, I do that also. And I think, you know, when the, to the question about how do you celebrate your wins and, and grieve your losses, um, if, the, if it's work related, you kind of do it in the context of work, I think. But um, it's nice to, you know, congratulate yourself for a job well done. Um, think about what went wrong if something went wrong, you know, and learn from your mistakes, but not dwell on them because everybody makes mistakes. And then it's nice to just kind of shut the door at the end of the day and do something that you that you care about. And so the panelists have given wonderful ideas and I've got my own things, but I do try to, you know, I sometimes have to work on the weekends, but I try to carve out space that's just for me and, and for my family. And um, I would say that that probably applies to all of our audience members who are, are students and working hard and have a lot going on in their lives is make sure you make some time to do things that are just special for you and don't worry about all the other pressures that you have if you if you can let them go for a little bit. All right, we are literally at time. And thank you for a really lovely conversation. I think this is the way we should all begin our days. Um, thank you for your insights. Um, I'm looking forward to talking to each of you individually at a different point in time. Um, but I think there are some gems that definitely come out of this, right? So the shifting away from leader as one in control, one who knows everything, one who is uh, all powerful, to thinking about leadership as about building relationships, as about empathy, as about listening carefully, and always, of course, asking questions and pushing ideas forward. The importance of taking care of oneself as a leader, right? Taking care of oneself in terms of celebrating, in terms of managing uh, your, how you present yourself and doing it in a way that is consistent with your own values. Um, being grateful, right? The spiritual practice of recognizing what has happened that is beautiful, what wasn't quite so lovely, but being happy that you actually had an opportunity to do the thing and to grow from it. Um, I really value this conversation and I know that our ambassadors have lots of questions. So let's bring this conversation to a pause, not an end. Um, and thank you again. I would like to just say, if you do wanna follow up with me, you can find me on LinkedIn and I am very accessible. Feel free to message me and I would be more than happy to answer any questions that you didn't feel comfortable asking in a group format. Um, I'm available to every everyone that is here today. Okay. Yeah, seconding that. <laughs> oh, yeah, me also. Okay. Me too.
All right, ambassadors, uh, we have four ambassadors who will be um, presenting their questions and comments. Uh, so we look to hear from them now. We have Jimena, Aria, Halima, and uh, did you say you wanted, it was a Joanna or Johanna? Johanna. Johanna, right. Uh, who will be presenting their questions and engaging with the panelists. Hello everyone, I'm Jimena, I'm 15 years old and I come from Mexico City. I was very nervous before the summit. When I was accepted, I wasn't 100% sure if I wanted to join or not. What if I'm not as good as the other girls? But despite this, I decided not to listen to the negative voice inside my head and I accepted the invitation because opportunities as big as this one should never be turned down. The fear vanished when I realized how nice and welcoming everyone was. There was such a positive energy in the group since day one, something that from my experience mainly happens with groups formed with women with similar interests. So far, the summit has been a wonderful experience. I feel different. I've learned, I've grown, and so have the other girls. This was a very eye-opening experience, meeting all these magnificent, brilliant, independent women and learning everything that they've accomplished is just very inspiring. Learning about serious issues that, uh, and what we can do as leaders to help them or fix uh, these issues is wonderful. The speakers have taught us things that we'll remember our whole lives. We've learned how to be better leaders, how to deal with certain people or issues, to speak up even if we're young, uh, between other things such as sustainability, mental health, and domestic violence. Just as each of us learned from the speakers and the organizers, we've also learned from us. We all think different. We all have different cultures and listening and learning as much as we can from each other makes us grow and become better citizens. Uh, but not only becoming a leader and helping our local communities, but also becoming an, a global citizens. Uh, we built a beautiful group where there is trust and support. Many of us has, have opened ourselves to sensitive issues and it's precisely because we feel the support and the sisterhood of these women. I am very grateful to having the pleasure of meeting all of them, even if it's on the screen. Thank you. Okay, ambassadors, would any of you like to present any of your questions? Um, yeah, I can start. Um, I'm Aria from Chicago and I'm 14. And um, the first question is um, from the Q&A, which is, as a female leader, what has been one of the biggest barriers in your career and how did this barrier affect you in your journey? I'm, I'm happy to start. It's a great question. Um, I think it's, it, for me, it would be that what we've been talking about here in different types of leadership. So I work for a very large law firm and large law firms in the United States and throughout the world are generally majority men. And, and not so terribly long ago, there weren't even women lawyers who worked in large law firms. So I've had to navigate a structure where it's men who are in power, it's men's cultural style, which is sort of rewarded. And I think what we've been talking about here today, this, the, the, uh, a more feminine style of leadership of empathy and listening and building coalitions um, was, was something that just was not rewarded in a large law firm. So something I've worked on in the last 20 years in my law firm is um, trying to educate people about that and, and trying to embrace different styles of leadership and understanding you know, that the diversity of thought that a diverse group of people brings to a problem or to a work assignment is much, is much better than uh, just having the same type of person trying to solve a problem. So I think my biggest challenge has been trying to open the eyes of my colleagues to, uh, we, we don't all have to be the same to be successful. Jimena, I love I loved what you said, um, just when you were introducing yourself, because um, you said, what if I'm not good enough? And uh, that I would say is the biggest barrier or one of the biggest barriers in my own leadership journey. But it's also one of the one of the things that I think overcoming it um, has given me even more confidence. Um, you know, that that idea of imposter syndrome or, you know, why why am I in this position? I, I can't do this. Um, but, you know, finding ways to believe in yourself, um, I think also 
it just helps you realize that you actually can. And, and even when people underestimate you, even when you come in as the underdog, that's actually sometimes the most powerful position to be in because um, they are even more overcome with how successful you are in the room. Um, so don't let that voice inside of your head um, tell you that you that you're not good enough. Um, you you always are, and it it will only compel you to work harder and and also recognize that many times everyone else in the room has the same thought. Thank you so much, um, Aria and Shamina. Um, for me, it's been realizing that um, I don't. I don't need to look down on myself, but that I have something to bring to the table and um, that I don't need to think that just because there are not too many people like me in the room, what I have to say doesn't matter. So it's a journey that I'm on and it's really about always reminding myself what it is that I'm bringing to the table and that I do not have to be the same as everybody else. But I think what's even more important is that is showing up. I love uh, Shamina said that she didn't allow the voice in her head because sometimes you miss out on opportunities because you limit yourself. Um, you know, you get an invitation and you think, oh, you know, maybe I shouldn't do this one, you know, but it's always important. And I think in my journey, showing up, being present has, helped me and has enabled me to get to places that I wouldn't have gotten to had I not shown up. So well done to all of you for showing up and thank you so much, Mina, for voicing that. I would also love to add, it's an, actually one of the panelists, perhaps it was Joanna alluded to it earlier as well, it's uh, f looking for leadership opportunities, which all of you have done, of course, because you are here. One thing to note is sometimes you don't find them and then you have to create them. So if there is no opportunity, build one. Is there an organization that you think is wonderful that needs a chapter in your high school? Is there a group that you can organize, that you can build, that you can create out of nothing you know, it's really not that different than having a, you know, a gathering at your place. You just grab friends together, you decide on a theme, you develop a mission. It could just be, hey, I'm going to start a clean up the parks club and we're going to get together every Saturday and go clean up the parks. Whatever that is, you know, it's not only is that phenomenal leadership experience for you, I do keep coming back to your academic careers. It's wonderful things to put on a resume is I, I started co-founder or co-founder as opposed to just leader is, is another way to go about it. So look for those. And if you don't find them, create them. You can absolutely do it literally out of thin air. You have the skill set. Um, thank you so much for your thoughtful answers. My name is Halima. Uh, I'm from Chicago. I'm 16 years old. Um, and one question that one of the ambassadors had was, um, uh, was there someone who inspired you? If so, who was it and why did they inspire you? Um, my mom uh, has always uh, inspired me. Uh, she uh, is a retired teacher uh, in Soweto and she always inspired me to, she, she always used to say, you never stop learning. And when I was in school, I used to think that was ridiculous because I was like, I want to stop learning and go make money, you know, and indeed it's true. Um, I've never stopped learning and that's why I've, I've, I continue to look out for opportunities to, to build myself, to learn, um, to, um, to, to, so that I can better be, to equip myself to do the best that I can be and lead in a better manner. So my mom is, uh, is my inspiration. 
Yeah, sim similarly, I would say it was my parents and particularly my father made a really big deal when I was growing up of the fact that women can do anything and that I needed to stand on my own two feet and not depend on a man to change the light bulbs or anything else. Um, and it's it's it served me well. I think it served me well in my career. It's also served me well in my personal life. I um, have been a single mom to two teenage boys for about the last 15 years, one of whom is severely disabled. And when I look back on this, I think, I don't know how I figured out how to do this, but I never doubted that I could do it. It's 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 been fine. It's been great the whole time. Well, it hasn't been great the whole time, let's be real. It's two teenage boys, but uh, they they are great. And um, I think it was my father just always, in, in, you know, telling me you can do anything. You don't need a partner by your side. And um, I really appreciate that. I think there were a couple questions in the Q&A um, that speak to how um, how does one manage um, possible tensions or contradictions between what one wants for family life and one's personal and um, one's kind of public and leadership life? So perhaps you, any of you could speak to that. Yeah, so I have four kids and right now their ages are between five and 10. But at one point I had four kids that were four and younger and I was an equity partner at my law firm. Uh, and I just put my book out. So I, I completely relate to that question. Listen, sometimes you cry. It's hard. You know, life is life is hard. I, you know, and somebody put put in the chat and I tried to answer fine. Having a good partner, life partner is not essential and necessary. And there are plenty of single moms out there doing it. And I don't want to send mixed messages there, but, but it helps a lot. I mean, from a practical point of view, having a co-parent a partner who isn't just tolerant of your success, but actually celebrates it, a partner who actually would be happy with you excelling above them in, in a professional world is, is very helpful. Um, if, if not that, then a village or a tribe. I mean, it really, it, it takes a tribe, you know? And I, I see so many single moms out there succeeding and the ones who are out there succeeding are the ones who have great relationships, they have, they have people who step in when they need that assistance. For me, one of the things I do is I try to incorporate my children into a lot of the work that I do. And that, you know, that means actually explaining to them what it is that I'm doing. So if, if I were, if I, you know, Megan, I would love to hear, I don't know if you have kids, but it would be so cool if I were an architect, because every time I walked into a space, I could talk to my kids about the design and the concept and sort of like bring that into, you know, bring it into that. Do you have that experience with your kids, Megan? I, you know, I do. <laughs> I actually, we just finished a building here in Chicago um, for Columbia College Chicago. It's their new student center. Um, go check it out. It's um, right by the Palmer, Hill, or the, sorry, not the Palmer, the Hilton Hotel, um, uh, just off of Michigan. But, um, you know, one of, my, one of my kids, so I have, I have an eight-year-old and a four-year-old, and the four-year-old always wants to see it's like, show me your building, mom, <laughs> show, because it's very tangible, right? Show me your building. Like, I think in his mind, like I built it. <laughs> you did. I mean, um, yeah, yeah. You, um, but, you know, I, I think the, the balance thing is, you know, it, uh, I mean, absolutely. It's, it's hard, right? It's hard at times you, you look up and you think like, what am I doing? Just, but at the same time, uh, I think there's actually, you know, and, and I, again, I don't want to send this as a mixed message, but I think for me personally, when I had children, it gave me a perspective that actually really made my, made me better at my job. Um, and, and I, I think that, that, you know, it, it also gave me, um, I, I, you know, was very high achieving, high strung. If I wasn't working, I felt guilty. And, you know, the fact that I had to shift and focus wholly on my children um, was a really good thing for me. <laughs> and um, again, I don't want to send the message that you must have kids in order to have some balance in life. But um, for me personally, it gave me that perspective. And uh, I think it also gave me the headspace, right, to, to get myself out of my work long enough that actually made me think differently and, and better about some of the things that I was um, tackling at work. Yeah. Oh well, I'm I'm still working on that. I I struggle um, with 
with the <laughs> work-life balance. Uh, in fact, um, I grew up, uh, my, my parents uh, were fantastic. You know, I grew up with my dad taking me everywhere I need to go. He would fit, I mean, wherever. He was like my, my personal chauffeur. And my mom um, would also be very supportive of any endeavor that I was a part of. I, I remember in, um, in college, I participated in a Southern, uh, Southern Africa uh, student volunteers organization. And my parents literally arrived and found me packing with my passport in my hand. And they said, where are you going? And I said, I'm going to Uganda to volunteer to build schools. And they were like, okay. And my dad promptly helped me pack my bags. And, you know, so unfortunately I have two little girls, a six-year-old and in 11 year old and um as a single mom it's 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 difficult and i haven't found the way to in, try and incorporate them nicely you know into my work you know they do come to the office and they see what to do what we do i um when when, when there's a function for instance that uh, for instance the function that can allow for kids to come you know i bring them along but i'd like to do more and i i love what you were saying about you know showing your kids you know the beautiful buildings that you've done. So I'll, I'll, that's something I'm aspiring to do more. Uh, my, my advice on this topic is, is a quote that one of my colleagues said to me when I was a, a young lawyer, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. We all have a lot of different goals and aspirations in our life and some are personal and some are professional. And it's okay to not be focused 100% on all of it all of the time. Uh, you know, there might be times in your life where you need to focus very hard on school. You know, you have to study very hard to get into the university that you want to attend, but there might be times when you can focus a little bit more on your family or your friends or a sporting activity that you enjoy. Um, for me, when I had kids, and particularly when my younger son was born with severe disabilities, I went to a reduced hours schedule at work, and I did that for about kind of five to eight years at uh, uh, different gradations of, of my commitment at work because I felt like my kids needed me then and I had to be home more then. But as they got older and more independent, I worked more. Um, and that that I was lucky I had supportive colleagues who who allowed me to do that. But I that would be my advice is don't feel like you have to be perfect at everything you do all the time. There's different times in your life to focus on different goals. That's okay. And that's a great... Uh, that's a great comment, I think, um, because there's a way that young people, the less, the, what the messages that a lot of young women are getting is that there's this inherent conflict and that they need to sacrifice one for the other in some fashion. And I think part of what the stories are that, that's, uh, that you're telling is that it's constant negotiation and you make choices and you make priorities uh, in ways that serve your larger vision for your own life. And it doesn't have to be this kind of fundamental conflict. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just also thank Pumzile for just being so candid with the I need to do more because it's also just so important to acknowledge, you know, the areas where we feel that way. And the reality is literally everyone, all 102 participants, all the panelists, everybody who is on the Zoom right now feels that there's something they're not doing right in their life. We all feel that way, whether it's balancing kids and careers or parents and friends or chores and homework or whatever it might be. And so we want to acknowledge that. And it, it really goes to Joanna's point as well, that sort of, you know, quest of, of improvement is, is noble and worthwhile, but also, you know, cut yourself some slack. You know, you're doing, you're doing a great job, you know, and every day is, a, is another chance to do it a little bit better. So Thank you for that reminder, Pumzile. Um, my question is uh, how you deal with negative reactions to your leadership and how you, you deal with unjustified negative reactions to your leadership. The first thought is ignore it, <laughs> but that's not true. <laughs> um, I'm a... Um, a relationship builder in terms of just uh, that's my leadership strength in fact I, I just recently did the strength-based leadership um, uh, program and, and that's a core part of my strengths so I usually um, uh, try and 
build relationships to the level where somebody would try and at least come to me and approach me if they think something is wrong. And, and if they believe, for instance, I have a quite a small team that I lead here and the consulate is not so big. So I have this open door policy and I know everybody and I, I always tell them that, you know, if there's something that you believe um, I could have done differently, come and talk to me. My door is wide open and I've actually had people who do have the courage to come and say, Consul General, I didn't like it when this happened and, and we talk about it. Um, but it's something that you need to build over time um, it, uh, to give people the space and the safety to be able to know that you will not retaliate on them on other issues, especially when you are the one that has the power. Yeah, I, th I think it's, I mean, just to build on that, um, there are a couple of things. I think one is just to be, to kind of train yourself to be comfortable in those situations and to, um, to kind of recognize that those are just human situations, right? And, and people, they're, they're often, you know, filled with conflict or emotion. Um, and I think just, you know, being very present and, and open to listening. Um, and I think the other thing is, I, I think oftentimes, people's reactions um, reflect something else that's going on with them, right? And so, and, not, and that's not meant to dismiss those reactions, but rather to compel us to ask why, right? So, okay, you know, here's your reaction to what I'm saying or to how I'm doing this. Let's, let's sit down and understand. And this definitely goes back to what Pumzili just said about relationship building, right? You know, you're again, and it's, and it's back to empathy, right? Understand the person's position. And, and then sort of see where you can meet more closely than you were when you started. Um, Johanna, first I wanna, I wanna let you know that I, in law school, I spent a summer studying in Prague at Charles University and I loved it there so much. I'm due, I'm due for a return visit. Um, but I, you know, I recently, and this goes with a lot of the theme of what we've been talking about versus male versus female styles of leadership. I was recently criticized at work by someone who's a superior to me for being too collaborative in a situation where he wished that I would have directed someone to do something. And, it, and what, and I can think of another example of something recently where somebody I think misinterpreted what I was doing and it just gave me insight into how I was being perceived. So I now know that this, this superior of mine is perceiving me as too collaborative and that's not what he wants. So I need to sort of prove to him I can be directive when I need to be directive and also need to show him why I think a collaborative style is important and efficient and effective in certain circumstances. So I try to, when there's a criticism, try to think, well, are they perceiving me the way I intend to be perceived? And if not, then maybe I can help show them what I'm intending and, and learn from it. Um. Thanks for that question, Joanne. And I think uh, your comments um, uh, kind of speak to some of the other questions that ambassadors were asking about how does one respond to sexism? Because really the context for everything that we're talking about is this notion that uh, what women are doing, that women's roles, uh, responsibilities, um, contributions are always being questioned or interpreted in a way that suggests that maybe women don't belong in those spaces. And so part of what I think the, the panelists have done brilliantly is to kind of show the ways that they navigate all of that through asserting very particular ways of thinking about leadership that don't necessarily mesh with what's happening around them, but the idea is to change what's happening around you. So it's if you're being an empathetic leader, if you're thinking that being collaboration is important, then, then that becomes part of what you bring and part of what you want to make happen, right? So to kind of remind our ambassadors, of course, that the values that you carry, uh, the ways you think about issues, uh, you don't need to be silent. Uh, people are gonna challenge, people are going to ask questions, they are going to second guess you and kind of communicate somehow that you don't belong. Um, and your responsibility is not to respond to that. It is to be your best self in those circumstances while also pushing back against them. So I think that was, a, thank you, uh, Johanna, for a really, really great uh, question. And I think on that note, uh, we will end today's program. Uh, thank you to everyone.
for your contributions. Uh, thank you to Jimena for a really powerful introduction to this, uh, this part of the conversation. Uh, thank you to all of the ambassadors for your questions and looking forward to being in, in, in community with you again. Thank you. Yeah, great job, ambassadors. You are just fabulous representatives. Really good job. And this is one of those conversations I wish you could just last for hours, probably with a cup of tea and keep it going, but we will have more. Um, panelists, thank you for being incredibly generous with your time and sharing your personal experiences and your expertise. And um, it's very generous of you. And this generosity is what fuels the summit and helps inspire the next generation of change makers. So thank you. In the audience, thank you for your time. We hope that you can join us tomorrow. Um, our ambassadors will be presenting projects that they've been working on through the week where they are scoring their cities on different gender equity scorecards around a, a number of different issues. And we'll have a keynote from Jody Williams who received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1987 for her work to ban landmines. So it'll be a fa another fabulous conversation tomorrow morning. Ambassadors, we're taking a five minute break and then please join us again through the new Zoom link. We'll see you soon and everyone else have a good rest of your day. Thank you.